My name is David Wood, a Chair London Futurist, and it's my pleasure to talk about three themes today. The first theme is how science and technology is poised to profoundly enhance human well-being compared to where we are today, not just in one or two areas of life, but in multiple areas of life. But it's not happening. It's not happening fast enough. There are obstacles in the way preventing us from really benefiting as we should from 21st century science and technology. And before I go any further, I wonder what your views are on this. What do you think is holding up humanity from fully taking advantage of the profound possible benefits of technology? No one can make a profit out of it. No one can make a profit. So no the profit system sometimes incentivizes people to invest in other things instead of what can be truly good for human flourishing. Dean? Humanity's own diversity of opinion. So well, there's lots of diversity of opinion. Some people say, if you go in this direction, we'll have uh, wonderful benefits from technology. And others say, no, 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 you should go in this direction instead. And some are Luddites. And some are Luddites. I'd say in imagination. Most people can't imagine what it is. We sell. There's a lack of uh, vision. So people think, well, it might be maybe 5% better than today. Is that really worth getting out of bed to work hard for making things 5% better? And don't realize that we could be possibly five times or even 500 times as powerful today. Yes? Or related to that lack of awareness. Lack of awareness as to what's possible. Yes? Maybe fear? Fear. Fear. fear of change. And it's tied up with not having a clear enough vision. You think, well, it might go like this, but oh, it could be terrible. And uh, do we really want this? Let's stick in our area of safety. And, yes? Maybe government regulations. That government regulations system. might stop us. Have you any examples of government regulations that's stopping technology <laughs> developing and being applied? been attempts, as far as I know, to ban the genetic testing in America. Yeah. So some people are saying, let's not have genetic testing uh, under George W. Bush. I think they prohibited using various stem cell treatments. They said it would be against the human spirit to do that. Uh, and there are other possible examples, too. Radek? Question, quick access to knowledge. Uh, so scientific journals... Uh, scientific <laughs> journals are often behind paywalls. And uh, so a lot of the potential good is locked up. Again, it's tied up with the profits. Matt? I think maybe a, a misunderstanding sometimes of what is mental health and what is well-being. Yes. You know, as science seems to be catching up with spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, it's revealing new ways of looking at um, what mental health actually is. So we still don't understand enough about no. what this positive vision could be. Absolutely. The fear is we get more technology. It's actually driving us crazier rather than making us saner. We spend more time and we fear missing out and we have more mental illness now by some measures than in the past. And so people are saying the yeah, of mental health is misunderstood. mental health misunderstood. Janina? A fear of unequal access. Fear of unequal access. So people are saying, you know, I'm not happy about this because it's just going to benefit Rupert Murdoch and uh, Donald Trump's advisors and Vladimir Putin and uh, Maduro in uh, Venezuela, and we don't want that, so let's stop it happening because unequal access will make things worse. Dean? Um, not enough profit opportunity. Too much risk, not enough return. Not enough, I think that's what Terry was saying as well, but I don't mind that being underlined and emphasized because I think that is a key point, and hopefully I'll be able to say that in a minute. So I'm going to cover my own views as to the obstacles, and I'm going to say, <coughs> of course, how we might be able to overcome these obstacles. I'm going to offer two things. I'm going to offer philosophy, the philosophy of transhumanism, and I'm going to offer not just different ways of thinking, I think we have to improve politics as well. These things cannot be changed just by good ideas, they have to be changed by good collective action. And that's the big theme of today's event. In terms of the obstacles, we're not, we had lots of good points made earlier. Here's what I wrote up beforehand. I think there's some similarity. Lack of a clear vision. Sometimes we've got a very naive idea. It's a bit like the people in the olden days who said, it'd be nice to live longer. Surely there is a fountain of youth. Surely there is one elixir. If we could only find that elixir, it would be fine. It turns out that's not how we can live longer. It'd be like in the Middle Ages, people saying, I'd like to go to the moon. How can I go to the moon? And with no <laughs> I I idea, maybe we can be fired in a big cannon and go to the moon, which Jules Verne wrote up in his story from the Earth to the Moon. So sometimes there is a lack of a clear vision. Sometimes we actually know what to do, but my goodness, it's hard. It's like nuclear fusion. Basically, we know how to make nuclear fusion. If it worked, it would be fantastic. We'd have energy on tap. 
of abundant scale, but it's very hard. And many of the things that we now know would make us live much healthier in terms of rejuvenation technologies. There's progress, but it's slow because it's a very complicated. So it's not a lack of vision, but lack of engineering development. And the problem here is really that there aren't enough people able to work on it. I don't think any of these problems are fundamentally uh, beyond human capabilities, but often people get involved for a bit, and then they run out of funding. And there's no profit in that, and so they go off and do something else instead. And we need to find ways to organize the capacity of humanity to address more seriously these breakthrough possibilities. And there's opposition. There's often vested interests who are quite happy, in a sense, with the way things are going now. And we'll see some examples. And they try to slow things down. They don't want to move on too quickly. And dare I say it, we have a pharmaceutical industry, which is more of a sickness industry than a health industry. And that's a bit unfair. But to some extent, it's more profitable to keep people slightly sick rather than making us completely better. Uh, and then there is regulations. We've heard a bit about that. Sometimes regulators are fearful for some reason. I don't think they're all wrong. There are reasons to be afraid of the ways in which technology might be applied. Sometimes they are just clinging on to a past, simpler vision, which is no longer appropriate. Informed, guided by what I would call outdated philosophies. Philosophies that say, you know what, we humans are fine as we are. We don't need to be better. We shouldn't be tampering with human nature. We have been created, as it says in Holy Scripture, as good. Let that man try to play God. And I say these are inappropriate philosophies in today's age. We can improve human nature. It's not going to be easy, but we should not shy away from that. We must improve human nature, I would say. If we keep human nature the same as it is and make us stronger and more powerful and more capable, what we'll do with that combination is terrible. And last, we get distracted and demotivated and discouraged and divided because it is damned hard doing all this stuff. And so lots of people who set off to change the world get distracted and they end up doing a much simpler product <coughs> instead, which makes the world maybe 0 0.11, 0 0.001% better, but doesn't fulfill. I said we could fix some of this with philosophy. I want transhumanist philosophy to show the faults and issues and problems with these outdated philosophies. I want transhumanist philosophy to set more clearly a tangible, credible, compelling vision about how humanity can do better. But it's not just philosophy. A lot of these things are to do with power structures in society, power structures in economics, and we're going to need better politics to do it. A bit like, this may not be your favorite politician, but I think it's a good example. Do you recognize who this is? Kennedy, and what was his kind of compelling vision that he managed to unite many resources behind? Yeah. Putting a man to the moon, and bringing him back as well. Declared when, 1961, emphasized again in this speech in 62, we're doing this, and do these things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard, they're organized, the best of our energies and skills. It's one that we're willing to accept, <laughs> we intend to win, even though it's dangerous. But this may be the greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. And he managed to get people across the political spectrum. He was a Democratic president, but he had Republicans and Democrats and people of no political persuasion saying, you know what? This is a higher vision. It's worth doing it. It's a, and when it did happen, the end of the decade, so many people around the world were watching on TV. Which I think he was wrong. It isn't the greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. That is to come, and that is when we don't just put ourselves literally on the moon, it's when we literally can raise our consciousness and our flourishing much higher. And that's what we should be doing next. Now, are there examples of a political leader making wonderful things happen, or political initiatives? Before, we, we talked about things that politics might get wrong, but w any positive examples of what politicians have done? Gandhi. Gandhi, yeah. uh, because of his uh, vision of let's do things in a, in a non-violent way. Yes. He's then, inspired so many people, yes? Yes. So he said, the way we can transform power is not by being more overtly powerful, but by somehow being powerful in a different way, soft power, which has uh, had a, a legacy in many ways. Rupesh? Uh, climate change. Climate change. Well, has it happened? Have we had positive politics in, in improving climate yet? Maybe the, the, Paris, the Paris Agreement was yeah. a start. You know, yeah. It was the biggest ever meeting of world leaders. Uh, although it is uh, struggling, it's, uh, it hasn't quite got the... 
good. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, because because he has a dream. He had a dream which uh, he was very good at articulating. Uh, the people in multiple races sitting down together, and uh, indeed, CFC reduction is probably a better example of successful. So uh, CFCs climate. were causing not global warming; they were causing the ozone layer. Uh, hole in the ozone layer. And people realized there was a problem, and uh, there were some politicians. There was a chemist who was the prime minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher. She may not be everybody's favorite politician, but she was a chemist, and she understood the issues of the uh, CFCs are going to cause this hole. And the uh, politicians said, well, we're going to change some of the regulations. We're going to make it uh, more expensive to use CFCs. And, uh, and guess what? <coughs> Clever technologists were motivated as a result to develop alternatives to CFCs. And so we'd still do all the things we used to do, or use CFCs for, but we changed. I think so. I think the long-term investment that the, the public state does in terms of investment in things like the internet, the internet was not invented by private companies, GPS satellites, which we all rely on, probably quite a few of us today, finding our way here, we use GPS satellites. It was not developed by a private company. The basic technology was done by public uh, public governments, infrastructure, things like the legal systems that we rely on when we get into contracts, the reliability of property. If you try and do good business and there's no security of property ownership, you don't get very far. Science as a whole. I look at the creation of the welfare state. I think this was not done for short-term profit. Maybe in the long term you can say it's profitable and sensible, but in the short term it did not make sense to do it. The money spent on vaccinations and on health. Arguably, the two biggest healthcare initiatives of the last century, in some ways, were the governments getting involved and in saying, "What? We're going to pasteurize milk, and we're going to sanitize water, and we're not going to let water be sanitized." And you, it's not so sexy; it doesn't get lots of write-ups. And if you look at the figures, by some counts, this brought down dramatically the number of childhood diseases there were, with uh, people having uh, milk that was often contaminated look at other safety regulations. Often industries don't put safety to the core to start off with. Look at the car industry. Cars used to be fatal when there were accidents. And uh, engineers thought, well, we could do this, and it would make the car safer. And the manufacturers said that would make the cars more expensive. People don't want to spend more money on safety. They all think they're good drivers. They all think nothing's ever going to happen to them when they drive. And eventually, the government said, you know what, we're going to mandate safety. And now it's flipped, and everybody does think about the safety features of cars, but it wouldn't have happened just by the market itself. Breaking up monopolies, well, I could talk a lot about Microsoft. Microsoft was my mortal foe for a long time in the <laughs> smartphone industry. Microsoft was basically saying at one time, we know best, we have to bundle the browser, the Internet Explorer, with the operating system. We can't possibly separate them. And the government stepped in and said, you know what? We don't believe you. We're going to insist on a free market and they allowed other browsers to come along. And thank goodness, because browsers, as a result, are much better. And in term, long-term peace, I think the Marshall Plan uh, investments by the American, particular after the war, is a remarkable theme. Interesting, I've got a lot of earlier positive, well, is it politics or is it ruling? It's ruling. public action. Public action. How about the, Medi the Medicis and their patronage of Galileo and Michelangelo? Yes. The interesting thing, of course, they're not democratically elected. That was a ruling family, and it was patronage yes. rather than a state. They were the ruling family, and thank goodness they did back Galileo and other scientists, and uh, we made progress because of that. Nowadays, uh, some philanthropists do back, some powerful people do back science. But I think what could be done if another Kennedy figure was to say, I have a vision. Our vision is we can have much, much better quality of life, much, much better quality of health, provided we tackle aging, provided we tackle the degeneration, the, the <coughs> mental health issues and so on. I think so much more could come. David, can I just ask, it's, it's interesting though that um, the Kennedy phenomenon happened against a foe. It was against the backdrop of the Cold War. Yes, so he did it because if we don't do it, maybe the Russians will get there first. But CRISPR has also been developed in China yeah. against so the question is, do we need an enemy? Yeah. And maybe the enemy is death. Maybe the enemy <laughs> is aging. Maybe the enemy is human stupidity. Maybe the enemy is human alienation. We can say, you know what? If we don't work fast enough and hard enough, we're going to be defeated by that enemy. We're going to end up frail and weak. We're going to end up uh, the victims of the madness of the mob. 
rather than the intelligence of the human spirit. But that's an eternal enemy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's an eternal enemy. Yes. It's a civil war. It's, yeah, so maybe I, I think we change won't happen unless there's a vision of the good and the bad. The good that can happen with the change and the bad that will happen if we don't change. And I look ahead and I can see many bad things potentially happening in society unless we raise the quality of human life, raise the quality of human nature. Another argument for why I think we need politics is to do with this curve. Exponential progress. Examples of exponential progress in science and technology? Any examples come to mind? Computing power. What's that called? Moore's law, yes, which says that every so often the semiconductors become smaller or more powerful or cheaper. Every, what, 18 months. Since 1959, the first time there was an uh, integrated circuit. Any other exponential progress laws? Users of the internet. Users of the internet is growing, but it's not going to grow exponentially. It's, it's bound to come, and that's a good example. It's bound to come to an end because it's been doubling and doubling, and it's, unless we count the machines, maybe we can count the machines. So that's a, that's a good example. Anybody heard of Cooper's Law? Yeah. Cooper's Law is about the wireless networks. Nowadays, we're just about to get 5G. Before, there was 4G and 3G and 2G. And if you go all the way back to 90, 1895, not 1985, 1895, when Marconi was doing his first experiments, the wireless networks were absolutely terrible in these days. And roughly every 30 months, according to Marty Cooper, one of the inventors of the mobile phone, still alive, just over 90. Uh, every 30 months on average, the network gets twice as powerful. Then the Swanson's law about the improvements in uh, photovoltaics. Solar power is cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. It roughly doubles in power for the same cost every, turns out to be 10 years, since 1976. And the last on this, Carlson, Rob Carlson, has, was the first to plot the change in gene sequencing, that it used to be very expensive to do gene sequencing and it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper from about the 1970s onwards. In the 1970s, they didn't sequence an entire genome, they just did a little bit, and every two years, the price came down in half. Mm. Yet in most cases, they're only exponential of the first part yeah. of the hockey stick. They then turn into an S-curve. But I was about the doubling <laughs> speed can vary over time, progress comes in waves. Like that, yes? I was going to say asymptotes, <laughs> no, actually no, in some, cases, in some cases there's hard asymptotes. Sometimes... Law is Shannon's law yeah. is the one which isn't on there. Yes, I mean, and I just picking a few before this slide got too crowded. Yeah, Sh Shannon, which is the, the total amount of information you can transmit for a given yeah. power. So I think indeed they all come to an end, and sometimes if you're lucky you can make a jump to a next wave, and I'll draw some pictures of that, but there's absolutely no guarantee of moving to a new wave. And if you look at things like Moore's Law, it's not completely flat. And Gordon Moore initially gave a doubling period of every 12 months. And then after 10 years, he said, you know what, 24 months is more reliable. And nowadays, it's still getting better. We're moving to smaller and smaller architectures. But it's now more than two years to yeah, jump. Question, to one uh, so with an example, so when we get down to, I don't know enough about semiconductors, when we get really, really close, then the next wave might be you might jump. Uh, to an extent, we're moving from CPUs to GPUs and from GPUs to TPUs. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll move to QPUs. That's graphics processing unit, tensor processing units, which are very good for doing some deep learning. And QPUs, quantum pro processing. You know, We might manage to make that leap forward. Indeed. So, But there's no guarantee we'll move to a new wave. And some things slow down. I mean, when I was young, Concord was going on great guns. And people were talking about, well, there's going to be son of Concord or daughter of Concord, which is going to go twice as fast again. That didn't go very far. So there's nothing guaranteed that's going to push us from one level to another. This is the g genome sequencing. You can see there to start off with, based on ideas from Frederick Sanger in the 1970s, they managed to get better and better at a fairly slow speed. Once every two years, they were doing twice uh, as many uh, pairs. And then from around this period here, they moved to a very different wave, <laughs> much faster, next generation with people like Illumina making a big jump forward. So there's nothing hardwired about it. In this case, things got a lot better because many people did see how to make profit out of it. 
many of the companies realize, you know, this is going to be very important for personalized medicine, it's going to be very important for all kinds of other things. Christian? There's a correlation with the fact that in 2007 there was a crisis. Don't think that's it. I don't think in this case. 2007, the crisis hadn't really happened. I think it was that the technology had got a bit better, a bit better, a bit better, and then enough people realized, oh my goodness, uh, personalized medicine is going to become a real thing at some stage. And it has. It hasn't quite lived up to all of the expectations, but it has made a big difference. And often people can have their cancer sequenced now, and you can find out these are the genes <coughs> that you unfortunately have had a mutated, and this is how we can fix your particular cancer. Alan? What, what was the blip in 2016 where it went? Well, this is interesting. And this is the figures from the US government website. So I don't understand this particularly either. But th this is real data as opposed to my hand-waving slides elsewhere. Dean? I, I have a suspicion the crash may be more factor in the flat, flattening between 2012 and ah, 2015. Yeah. Essentially, it meant that there was less re venture capital and other investment going in 2008 to 2010. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there, was a, there, was a, there was a dismay that we th people thought that the particular investments would have big benefits there was lots of uh, money going to the east coast of America, and it didn't pay back as quickly as they thought. And at the same time, there was this uh, financial crash. So maybe that is what caused us to slow down, although Illumina have done powerful things. I think Illumina have talked, they're, they're below $1,000 now, and they're talking about getting down to $100. But it doesn't happen automatically. And I think we need to steer things sometimes. We can't just wait for the miracle of the free market to always work. Sometimes we need to play an active guiding role, and that's what I think politicians should be doing. So just to recap that, there's the picture of the possible growth of S-curves. They often start slow and disappointing, it takes a long time talking about a new breakthrough technology. People have been talking about augmented reality, virtual reality for ages. In my industry, the smartphone industry, we talked about smartphones for ages, 1996, 1998, 2001, it wasn't happening, it wasn't happening. The investor stayed with us, and then, my goodness, it's taken off. So start slow <laughs> if things come together, if there's enough of an ecosystem, enough partners, venture capitalists who understand the space. Uh, some friendly legislation can make this happen, and it can boost. But in due course, it usually does run out of steam, and it slows down. If you're lucky, you might get a disruption to a new wave. And if you look at what's happened in Moore's Law, there have been many different architectural changes inside Intel. It's amazing. They haven't used the same architecture at all. They've used the same architecture for various bits of progress, and then they've had a breakthrough, and then another breakthrough. And if you're lucky, then you can move on to another branch with a new architecture, a new set of concepts, often, by the way, new people, people who are not dominated by the old way of thinking. So progress usually depends on the insiders, but sometimes it depends on outsiders. And sometimes, by the way, you need significant investment and this investment is often unpopular because people and companies who are making lots of money out of the old way say, this is going backwards. Why do we need this, you know? Yeah, in some science fiction, uh, you might uh, eventually have a great progress. But that's why people, unfortunately, often do not invest in the technologies which could transform our healthcare so much. So that's the kind of general theory. I think I'm use quite a lot of time on that when I mean, we had a nice bit of interaction. I would just like to run through very quickly human flourishing in the seven spheres and illustrate some of it at least with uh, some of the points I've talked about. I think if we put out collective uh, abilities, energies, intelligence together, we should be having later this century, by the middle of this century, maybe even 2040, abundant clean energy, abundant healthy food and water, abundant material goods of high quality, abundant all-round health, abundant all-round intelligence. Why? For the sake of positive mental experiences, creativity and exploration, all underpinned, a sometimes called a super democracy, abundant collaboration and democracy. I'll look very quickly at some of these. The clean energy stuff is about moving from our current uh, carbon-based energy systems which are very successful and very effective moving to clean energy in a principle it shouldn't be any problem because wind is getting more capable the whole time wind energy solar energy wave energy is all increasing I don't think it's happening fast enough we talked about Swanson's law doubling every 10 years and people argue that the coefficient argue about how fast it's going there's a huge inertia in industry to overcome 
There are many people in all levels of the oil industry whose bonuses depend upon them continuing to ship out lots of oil. Uh, it's been successful. We need not just today's solar energy and today's wind energy, we need next generation solutions, which are going to require a lot more investment. And to some extent, we have to go backwards before we're going forward. New energy storage solutions as well. Elon Musk is doing interesting stuff there with his work on batteries. We're not doing enough. I think we need to look at nuclear solutions as well, not just yesterday's nuclear solutions, but uh, there are lots of promising new solutions. We need to accelerate what we're doing with carbon capture and storage to pull that out. Again, people have ideas. Again, they're often struggling to get the investment or support that they need. I think politicians should be much more vocal about this. If we're not more careful, there is a risk, and it's hard to measure this, and we can have a long argument how fast the climate is changing. All I would say is that we can't model it for certainty, and there are risks of climate change accelerating. That's an argument to have extra public funding of green tech, to encourage challenges to the companies. A bit like uh, the big tobacco companies eventually got sued in court for the damage they were caused. I think we can encourage companies to sue uh, oil companies when it looks like they are probably contributing to various bits of short-term climate change. And then there's a whole bunch of economics down here, which I won't go through, but the idea is if you don't price in the externalities, the things that are happening but aren't covered, with something like a Pigovian tax based after Arthur Pigo, uh, the British economist from the middle of the last century, uh, we uh, run big risks. So that's basically what we should be arguing for. We should be getting faster funding for green tech, and we should be helping people to use the legal system and helping people also to use the taxation system, in which everybody will benefit from this as well. Very quickly on food and water, there are similarly positive things that can be done. The world is suffering in many places a shortage of fresh water. That's very serious. Desalination in principle will solve things, but desalination often generates a lot of salt in the process. It's a bit messy. New pro projects there in terms of growing food. I think there's ample ways in which we could feed very healthily, ever be on the planet. In fact, 10 times as many people as are on the planet with vertical farming, with lab-grown meat, <coughs> artificial photosynthesis, which can be, shockingly, maybe 10 times as efficient as natural photosynthesis. And GMOs, I'm a fan of genetic modifications, but there are dangerous side effects from very powerful companies who often bully their way in with particular solutions and they are not motivated to point out the flaws and the risks in their technology. So I think we should be pushing harder for getting to cleaner, safer, uh, more dramatic change, especially the lab-grown meat, when instead of uh, so much of the land and the earth being used to turn crops into beef or meat in a very efficient way, in a very uh, dramatic way, we could uh, do this more effectively. So Peter, that what, what is it's uh, doing the same things as plants do, but they can be done uh, more efficiently. But with uh, plants? Or no, with uh, other chemical reactions. Oh. It used to be said, this is incredibly complicated. We can never understand what's going on in photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. I remember my chemistry teacher teaching me that at A level. But it turns out, mm, probably there's people in the Zoom who know much more about chemistry than I do. But I think uh, in terms of efficiency, there are some experiments and uh, the amount of energy coming in and turned into Food in plants is something like 1% to 5%, but in some of these lab experiments, we can get to 10 or even 20%. It's producing sugar, is it? It's producing uh, sugars or equivalents, yeah. Yeah. other things that people can eat. Right. But it wouldn't be like an artificial cabbage, then? I don't think it's an artificial cabbage. Oh, okay. uh, is something relatively new for me as well? I'm going to do some more research on that. Right. I've been uh, slightly exposed on this point. Dean? <coughs> All of the beneficial technologies we're mentioning here, yep. and also the energy side, all come with potential security problems. Yes. Particularly the energy, if we're reliant on you know, uh, photovoltaics, storage, essentially anything electronic, inherently is hackable, whereas arguably burning stuff isn't. So whilst it all comes, so in other words, they all have externalities. Yep. And the problem with trying to value externalities is you then, you can always go down a rat hole of finding more and more and more externalities about different things. It's hard. I entirely agree, measuring externalities is hard. 
and there are many positive externalities of the oil industry too. Should we therefore give up and say we're just going to leave it to the market to make its own mind up about these things? I think we have to have a big discussion and we put as many externalities into the equation as we feel confident, we understand, and we, we should use that. And we may get it wrong, and you're quite right to point out there's probably a whole broad breadth of things to do with security. The issue with foods is often monoculture. We find out <coughs> a particular way of growing wheat is more effective and more efficient than before. But then we get rid of all the diversity and then suddenly it becomes vulnerable to a particular uh, disease. So we should avoid being too dependent on monoculture and we should avoid being too dependent on things that might be zapped by, for example, uh, an electromagnetic pulse. There's a question over oh, here. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit worried about um, gathering more power from the sun. Sinking into the earth and how does that affect climate change? Oh. Because yeah. if you're dragging in a lot more energy into the, onto the earth, yeah. surely that's going to go. Well, the energy from the sun comes here already. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we, could, we should be capturing it. Yes. A lot but of it's reflected back, yes. Yes, so we, we don't get... But we only need a tiny fraction of the energy that's coming from the sun. We, something like a, what we could capture in a, in a single day, maybe two days well, yes, now yes. would be enough. I understand that, but we have, we're capturing that energy. It's the external from the earth, and therefore it must add to the earth's yeah. wall. Well, the problem is today a lot of the energy comes to the earth and bounces back and gets trapped in the greenhouse gas layer. So we're capturing more energy from the sun, but it's not going in the places we want it to go in. It's heating things up all over and disturbing the temperature. I think you make a good point. Now, if I was chairing myself, I would be cutting myself off at this stage because I have gone well over my limit, and there's very interesting uh, talks that's going to come from two other speakers. So I'm just going to briefly say there are other examples of new technologies which should be changing the world but hasn't. Nanotechnology is a particular sad case because the vision that Eric Drexler set out in the 1990s on uh, factories, nanofactories, has never really been invested in it to the extent it could be. Many other people have done similar <laughs> things but they're not the same. The word nanotechnology has been grabbed for other things. So I think there's a whole lot more should be done this is one place the market has not managed to steer resources as it should. If we did this, we'll have better quantum computers, and then with better quantum computers, we could redesign many other things better. And what's 4D printing? 4D printing is things that you print and design to change over time. So you, do, you print them in one format, and then you expect, well, the heat or the magnetic fields or whatever is going to change it. So it's designed to evolve. What would be an example? Uh, there's quite a lot if you, if you do look at Wikipedia on 4D printing. Because uh, sometimes uh, it should change. In s and living things are changing in time, so you're creating things which have some of the same attributes. Uh, I'm out of time. I won't say much about health because my good friend Jose Cordero is going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, my point is we're not going anything like as far as, as we should with this next generation of rejuvenation technologies as taught by SENS. There's a lot more we can do there. In terms of all-round intelligence, that has improved a lot. High tech has brought us a lot, but it's not doing it as fully as it might do. The vision is that we should be smarter. Technology isn't particularly making us smarter. It's often flooding us with information, causing us nervous breakdowns as a result. But there's a lot more could be done, especially if we had artificial intelligence that understood us more as humans the artificial general intelligence, and that is often being neglected. So I think if we do that right, um, yes, there are dangers there too with uh, warfare and cyber warfare, but uh, let's have that discussion <coughs> and let's push more of the technology away from the current investment. Why are people investing in artificial intelligence today? It's often to make people click on things. Many of the smartest people are being paid lots of money to click on various links or to find ways to make people click on links. Let's direct more of that away. And finally, on uh, creativity, there's lots we can be doing with uh, technology to liberate us from the need to work. I'm a big fan <coughs> of robots taking our jobs, provided we can rearrange the benefits of the robots, the benefits of automation, so that everybody <coughs> gains. And that's a big topic, too. Collaboration, enabling the best insights of society to rise to the surface, that's what human collective intelligence should be doing. So overall, there's a lot to be done in terms of better politics. I will offer AI helping us make decisions. 
I think we need outsiders such as transhumanists to change the concepts that politicians talk about. You're going to hear later from uh, Matthew talking about an external new political initiative, the Transhumanist Party. The goal is partly to win power, but partly is to change the concepts that other technologists, other politicians talk about. Building alliances based on a groundswell of public support, as the philosophy of transhumanism is more widely shared, I think it's going to lead to changes in politics too. No time to talk about ethics. I will briefly talk. That's a shame. That's a shame. Uh, this you can't take away with you, but you can order online when I look in more detail about these seven areas that I've zoomed through now, as well as the overall picture. I want more people to understand the true potential of superabundance, the fact that technology is the key to getting there, but we can't just rely on technology, nor in fact can we just rely on the free market. We need to apply some of the principles I've spoken about. If that was interesting, I encourage you to look at H plus PD if you haven't seen that before. It's where some of us are gathering information about some of these topics. Uh, if there's no page there about artificial photosynthesis, maybe we should write one. And I also invite you to get involved in what uh, Matthew is going to talk about later, the Transhumanist UK Party. So that was my scene setting. I'm not going to take any questions now because we had quite a few questions en route. But I'm going to thank you for listening. And I'm going to ask you to welcome my co-author to the stage, co-author, as he'll explain, uh, Jose Cavero, on, let's go back to the first slide. Jose Luis Cadero is a Director of Humanity Plus, Director of the Millennium Project, Fellow of the Royal Academy of Arts and Science, and he's going to talk about some of the angles that I've looked at in terms of how we can use technology, particularly to improve our health and longevity. So welcome to Jose Cadero. Okay.